Hello, I'm Gerard van der Horst. I'm a senior consultant to Microptic, and I'm very privileged to present to you the use of computer-aided sperm analysis in the research environment. So, let's start straight away. You can see my association is with Microptic. Uh, I'm based at the University of the Western Cape in the Comparative Spermatology Laboratory, but I'm also very closely associated with the Reproductive Biology Group in, um, at the University of Stellenbosch, two different groups. And um, let's get going. So, I like to be very basic about um, uh, what is required. So, let's first talk basics. So, of course, you need a good microscope with a good positive phase and then negative phase for animals. And um, I'm not going to uh, allude too much to the fact that, um, um, that we need killer illumination and critical illumination. So that is absolutely crucial that you be able to set those properly. Um, you need a computer, uh, either a desktop or a laptop, with the software of SCA. And that includes the research version, which is human veterinary antox with all these different modules which you can uh, see here. And then it doesn't help that you have all this fancy microscopes, the fancy software, but you don't have a good research plan. You must know exactly what is the question that you are asking. And so this is really, to me, very, very crucial. So uh, essential research equipment involves particularly those things that involve temperature control, uh, where you can warm your bedia, the epidorphs with the sperm, and then, of course, the slides that will be studied under the microscope. We use layer slides. They must be heated up before the time. A good set of pipettes, and um, including anything from a um, 0.2 microliter pipette to a 1 milliliter pipette, uh, including positive displacement pipette. Often you have to wash semen. And when you wash it, you have to centrifuge a little bit. And so you need a good microcentrifuge. And then, of course, for your microscope, you need uh, a good camera. We use the Basler ACA 1300 that can do 200 frames per second. And that is ideal for 95% of your applications, including basic fluorescence. But here is a specialist fluorescence camera. I call it the cat in the dock because it can see very little light. And it's really an excellent camera to use. So uh, maybe this is a misnomer, essential research equipment, but it's good to have a very good pH meter that has a small probe for measuring small volumes of semen and, and um, media that you make up. Uh, you need a balance for what? Not only for making up chemicals, but for actually determining sperm volume. We weigh the sperm sample because... Because it's viscous, it's very difficult to determine the um, it uh, in a, in, uh, from a, 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 molar, a molar, uh, volumetric point of view. So, um, a next point is that, and in, under field conditions, you really need um, uh, to observe that you have no excuses for doing the work in the, under field conditions. Your temperature control there must still be perfect. Uh, whether you're working even here as we did with lions, uh, where our setup here was like a cutting edge lab, and there's no excuse for saying, uh, oh, I collected the sperm, uh, kept them uh, cool at four degrees overnight, and then analyzed the next day. Uh, I'm sorry, that is not really valid. Right, though. So, shall we use semen or wasp sperm, uh, which should be used for motility, morphology, and functionality studies? Um, I think with human and boar, we can get away with semen in the sense that we can do sperm concentration there and a lot of motility parameters. But it's basically for determining sperm concentration and sperm motility, and not really for doing sperm functionality. So accordingly, we need to process the sperm. And for that reason, we need to dilute it with suitable media. And there is uh, 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 species differences. HDF work well for human. Uh, for example, and TAMS F10 works well for RAM, and so forth. And you can see there's a whole range of excellent media that we can use, and hopefully with glutamine and bicarbonate usually added as important components. 
So, we're going to show you a swim-up technique, which is very important to collect sperm at the, um, at the top of the column. And then, of course, we will have, um, uh, as you can see here, differential centrifugation, and preferably you uh, we will use the washed bottom fraction after differential centrifugation. So, again, you can see uh, what is important here is the different techniques that we use. Look at the swim-up technique. And you can see with the, with the swim-up technique, um, we use raw semen here in a column of medium, like PBS or even better, and the spam swims out of the pellet into the medium and we collect it here. With differential centrifugation, it's a much better way. Uh, you may get some sperm damage because of the colloidal nature of the pure sperm. Um, but in the end, um, it, is, uh, it, is really, it is really better. And you can see here you have pure sperm 45%, pure sperm 90%. And what you do is you fold these into an Eppendorf. You put the raw sperm on top, you centrifuge. In the end, you have a pellet here, which contains a very high percentage of motile sperm. And here is a technique that we advanced at uh, the University of the Western Cape called the flush technique, uh, where we use raw semen uh, in, in a layer slide, only about 0.2 microliters. Then we flush it with a medium. The sperm is displaced to the one side, and then <clears throat> they swim from there into the medium. It's really an excellent method that works very well. So we measure uh, a vast number of quantitative uh, inter information and a vast number of quantitative data is actually produced. And um, uh, how should this be used in the research environment? Again, the emphasis on functionality. Please note, I'm talking about functionality, functionality, functionality. A lot of people say, yes, we've measured percentage motility or progressive motility or what the case may be. But no, what is really important is functionality. So it's important to look at averages of subpopulations. Which ones? Percentage groupings, um, <clears throat> similar, uh, for example, percentage progressive groupings relating to averages for kinematic parameters, and then also subpopulations for rapid, medium, and slow sperm, including the kinematic parameters. Further functional studies involves mucus penetration and hyperactivation. And you can see here that for humans, we probably have the cutoff values. But it's a big challenge to develop new methodology, to challenge sperm with the media with a viscosity equivalent to what is in the ovida. And we can use media such as egg albumin or methyl cellulose. For hyperactivation, and as you know, or may not know, hyperactivation is essential for a sperm, or it must be able to undergo hyperactivation before it can fertilize the oocyte. And in order to do that in the laboratory, we can activate it with progesterone, caffeine, procaine, hydrochloride, amongst others. These two ones, vitality, hypoosmotic swelling, and acrosome uh, intactness, I will cover later on. So let's first look at motility of human sperm in semen. And here you can see the sperm is swimming in pretty nasty environment, lots of prostatic particles there. And this is how the SCA CASA analyzes it. You can see the red sperm is fast progressive, the green ones less progressive, less fast, and then the blue one's not really progressive. This is in the case of negative phase contrast, where we have, uh, for example, tanqua goat sperm, and here you can see uh, at a high, high frame rate of 169 frames per second, uh, the sperm are really hyperactivating a star spin pattern, and here we uh, can show you how the tracks are reconstructed in the sperm class analyzer um, with all these parameters recreated. 
This is a very special one, which has uh, been developed over the last nine months by a team of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rieta Kotze and uh, Janice Murray and myself. And it was the first effort ever for people being able to do, or researchers being able to do, honeybee sperm. What is tricky about it is they have enormously long tails, and so one needs to use a fluorescence technique by where, whereby you only manage to stain or get the heads to fluoresce, and then you can do CASA on that, and this is how well it shows you, uh, it, anal it analyzes. This is really a, a new fantastic breakthrough because nobody has so far really managed to do full detailed CASA in terms of any insect sperm. So which parameters are we measuring? And you can see we can measure rapid progressive sperm, we can measure medium progressive sperm, and the percentages. And so all these values are calculated for each sample that we analyze. If you are interested just in the percentage rapid and the percentage medium, slow, all of that can be calculated. And here is quite a nice one showing you, uh, again, <clears throat> a very important point of looking at the subpopulations of the kinematic parameters such as the uh, curvilinear velocity, the average pass velocity, the straight line velocity. And it classifies the sperm um, for these parameters as those that are progressive, those that are repart progressive, and this is what I mean by functionally important and subpopulations. It's really important. Here also, if you look at the distribution of the curvilinear velocity, you can clearly see that um, uh, it's really the sperm above 150 micrometers per second swimming that are, that are of, of any importance. So one of our biggest problems is the cutoffs. How do we determine this? Um, and uh, there are several possibilities. We can do the frequency diagrams, or we can do receiver operating characteristic curves, which is almost the gold standard for this. So while we, <clears throat> some values exist for humans, we need to really establish these for other animals. And this is an extreme example of tanqua goat sperm um, in phosphate buffered saline, where you can see how beautifully they actually swim um, in, 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 in a very progressive manner, fast and less progressive and even non-progressive. But when you hyperactivate them, they show these typical star spin patterns, which as I've previously alluded to, is essential for being able to fertilize an oocyte. So you can imagine now as a starting point, it's really simple, it's very simple to then say, let's put in an Excel sheet the values, the kinematic values for all these sperm, and then under a different code for these sperm. And then we do rock curve analysis, and look how beautiful this comes out. You can see for the curvilinear velocity, the speed of the sperm, we know that when they swim above 221 micrometers per second, that belongs to hyperactivation. Or if they have a straight line velocity of less than 50, uh, they belong to hyperactivation. And in the end, we can use these parameters and develop a Boolean argument. Apologies for that. Uh, we can develop a Boolean argument. A Boolean argument is where we use a number of parameters to be able to define in the sort function of the sperm class analyzer which is hyperactive and which not. So you don't have to go and determine it every time. You add this to the sort function and um, uh, it will then classify the sperm as so many percent uh, hyperactivated. There are two more aspects for researchers uh, which, which can be considered really very, very, very important. And, and the first one is um, simply uh, one that relates to the advanced option of SCA. And uh, in the menu is um, a possibility of looking and uh, uh, getting your own permutations of rapid sperm, medium sperm, slow sperm. And I'm really surprised how few people 
actually uh, 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 use this uh, option. So the next one is on request. Um, you can get a special um, link from Microptic that, whereby a special Excel report is provided that will calculate all the mortality values all in one row. And accordingly, uh, you, you, you don't have to ex, um, extract this from uh, your file. You just um, uh, have it as an Excel file. So that is motility. So what about morphology? Um, in, 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 uh, in a research environment, if you want to compare different species with each other, it's good if you can use the same sperm, uh, stain. And here we use a stain called a sperm blue. And it works really well because it stains anything from human sperm to even abalone sperm and here is tamqua goat sperm. And you can see here in the case of tamqua goat, it has stained, uh, if we analyze it with CASA, uh, it, it recognizes the acrosome in this case, in red, you can make it different colors. Um, the rest of the head in, in, in blue and the midpiece in green. And you can see all these are green boxes, which mean normal sperm and that abnormal sperm. And I will show you how we do that. But let's first look at, at these ones. Um, and uh, this is just to show you if we use sperm blue and we use SCA morphology analysis, we can threshold the sperm beautifully in terms of acrosome, rest of it, midpiece. And then this is, for example, human, this is horse, this is dolphin, and this is elephant. And so, African elephant. And so it measures these eight parameters or variables for each, um, for each sperm. And so you have an enormous amount of information that you can now use to construct uh, um, and um, use to compare all kinds of things. In this case of African elephant, we compared season one to season two. Here we compared different rat strains, uh, uh, for example, Sprock Dolly to uh, Worcester rats. Um, and uh, so it has a multitude of possibilities. If you imagine you can do toxicology on this, uh, it's really excellent. So, um, but what is our biggest challenge? Our biggest challenge is to establish cutoff values for two major aspects. And that is the percentage normal sperm. What I've previously shown you is really just being able to measure the kinematic parameters. So that's an important challenge for us. And then the other one is to determine two indices, which is automatically done by the sperm class analyzer. Two of these are called the teratozoo spermic index or the mean anomalies index. And what do, what do they say? What do they tell us? That really tells us how many abnormalities there are per spermatozoan or for the population of sperm. And I think you will agree with me. When you take, for example, you have a human sperm where you have 10% normality, which is considered quite high in human, but the TZI is 2, which means there's about 2 abnormalities per sperm, then it actually means there is actually a bigger problem than we think. And then 10% normal is not such, such a good uh, number. So it's really important. And I found in the field of animal science, people tell me, come on, these are human terms. They've got nothing to do with domestic animals and wild animals. Why not? Uh, surely a sperm that has a whole range of abnormalities is the bigger disadvantage of one that is normal or that have just one abnormality. So I think it's very important. How do we determine these? And I, um, with collaborators here in the University of Stellenbosch, um, in Nigeria, uh, um, in, in France, uh, we've uh, actually managed to, to develop a technique whereby we look at frequency distributions and then determine what is normal. I do not really have the time to allude to the details of it, but except by saying that we look at all the parameters and then in the end, we try different permutations. And here you can see by, by doing that, here we can say, this is an abnormal sperm. It's typically spoon-shaped. It's not this one which is 
nicely curved, which is normal in a green box. That happens to be a microsperm also, and this is a macrosperm. With a manual assessment, you will never be able to see that difference. And so you need a computer to assess this, and we have determined this very accurately. The older literature suggests, even more modern literature suggests, rat sperm has 95% normality uh, on an average basis. Uh, and we have actually determined it's considerably less. It's around about 70% rather. And look here, the teratozoospermic index also gives us some kind of feeling. In sprogloli, there seems to be only about one abnormality per sperm on an average basis. This is just to show you, uh, in, for example, Tanqua goat, once we've done these frequency distributions, you can go uh, to the configuration, and then for normal sperm, you can add for length a minimum maximum for all these parameters. And in the end, by doing that, the sperm will be classified as normal or abnormal. Okay, what about hyperosmotic swelling? Um, and here you can see um, that we've developed a technique called bright vit, uh, which is basically a negrosine eucine method where eucine will penetrate uh, non-functional cell membranes and uh, it remains white if the cell membranes are intact. But note how these membranes are swollen. So we've made this medium up in a hyperosmotic medium. So if, for example, you have media that have changed the membrane permeability and you sometimes find that pink cells are actually swimming, which should not be the case because they're supposed to be dead, it actually just means that uh, you have changed the membrane permeability of, of that, but then... What is your alternative? You look at tail swelling, and that would then be a good uh, solution. Right. Last one here is the question of the acrosome reaction, uh, determining acrosome using PNA and the counter stain of Wurst. And all those sperm that have intact acrosome stain blue green, and here just blue. And you can see the computer program recognizes it beautifully as one which has undergone the acrosome reaction or was not acrosome intact. The one big problem is how do we handle all this data? You can see there's an enormous amount of data that we need to, to, to sort out. Just for motility, it's over 50 parameters. And for morphology, another 50. So um, what do you do this and what is the best way to go about this? So let me show you, and without getting too complicated, the trick is simplicity is the watchword. Make simple spreadsheets. Then do your standard statistics of do subpopulation averages, do frequency distributions, correlations. And then when you're comparing things, use either t-tests or when there's more than two sets of data, ANOVAs or crystal ones. And then, uh, very important, from comparing two different techniques, a manual technique versus a CASA technique, you must use Bland and Altman plots as the gold standard, and Passing and Bablock to really support that uh, what you're seeing is indeed correct. But apart from these statistical analysis, apart from these, uh, there is a whole range of multivariate visualizations that very few scientists, leave alone spermatologists use. And I'm just going to show you Andrews plots, and principal components. But these star glyphs and channel faces are also extremely useful. And so here is, uh, you can see uh, Andrews plots. And the data here was not significant between two treatments. But when we did Andrews plots, it actually showed that there is indeed a subtle difference there. And that would lead us to either compare the data in more depth statistically or do something else with it, but at least it is very valuable. This is principal component analysis, uh, where it analyzes our data and it creates eigenvalues. Without getting too complicated, an eigenvalue above one is important to analyze because it says there are three groupings here which are important. And it uh, represents these three groupings as a biplot, and you can see where we have these lines in the same direction, there seems to be strong correlations. Um, uh, in other words, there's a relationship here between straight line 
velocity and linearity, whereas the, for amplitude of lateral head displacement seems to be negatively correlated. So, what is our home take messages here? CASA is fortunately fast replacing the outdated manual assessments. You won't believe it how many people still hang on to this, um, despite the fact that it has been shown to be, uh, sorry, I, I'm coming back, despite the fact that it has been shown to be really inaccurate. Uh, functionality is the watchword, and uh, also relating these multitude parameters, of course, to fertilization outcome and live birth outcome. It's really important. You know, I mean, after all, what is in sperm quality and sperm functionality is the ability to fertilize an egg successfully. So we have also a whole range of new technologies that help us. So what is home take message two? It is one person can score goals, but teams win games. What do I have to show you here? Two wonderful teams that I work with, the Comparative Spermatology Group. There are a lot of new students which I have not added here. I apologize for that. Uh, uh, at the University of the Western Cape, also at the University of Stellenbosch. And each of these have contributed in a unique way. But also, of course, uh, this wonderful, sorry, I need to get back um, to this um, uh, wonderful team of Microptic, uh, who has been absolutely uh, remarkable in terms of um, uh, providing the infrastructure. Okay, then I can just say thank you very much for having the patience to listen to me. Not everybody has that patience. And I believe there's going to be a session where you can uh, 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 throw questions at me and I will try my utmost best to, of course, um, answer these. Have a nice day. Bye.